everyone. My name is Raisa Ghazi, and I'm going to give you a speech about the history of technology today. And that is closely related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'm going to explain to you why. But first, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask all of you at home a question, but also those of you here in the studio. All of us, we think a lot about doing the right thing in life, right? We think about doing the people around us justice, making a positive impact on society, and making the world a better place. Isn't that something that we all think about? I mean, we have a lot of women, so I guess the answer is definitely going to be yes, right? And so I have had the same journey. Obviously, I thought at some point, you know, how can I make the world a better place? And one of the things I had to learn during all of these workshops and studies about diversity, equity, and inclusion is that we make the world a better place when we know our history. Did you guys know that? That when you know your history, you can make the world a better place? Because that's what research actually shows. It shows that people who know their history are more likely to identify exclusion, discrimination, when people are misrepresented and harmed. And so my question for all of you is, do you know the history of technology? How many of you know the history, the founders of technology? Can we see some hands? I see some, a, a little bit of uh, <laughs> reservedness among the crowd. Some, some of you do know, right? But I think a lot of you also would say, no, I do not know that. And I think, if I may be honest, I think most of you do not know the history of technology. I'm just going to be very frank with you. You don't know the history of technology because it seems to be a hidden history. So I'm going to tell you a story. I started getting into tech a few years ago. And I have a master's degree in business. I have a master's degree in political science. And I learned here and there a little bit about technology. But when I started working for a tech company, I started getting more of the stories of the founders of technology. Tech is only a few decades old, right? So there's not a very deep history, it seems. And we're talking about people like Steve Wozniak. Uh, we're talking about a Bill Gates. Mark Zuckerberg, we're talking about the founders of Google, of Microsoft, of Facebook. Those were always presented to me as the starters of this industry. They built empires in their garages. They drove out co-founders to build something that could take over the world when they thought they could do it better. And they did all of this in an industry where trillions of dollars of money go around. And you can understand that in an industry like that, there's no room for people who are not big shots who understand it well. That's how they have been operating. And so one of the realizations I got very quickly is that there was no, not a lot of room for women. And that's why we're here today, right? There was not a lot of room for women in an industry like that. And that's also something I learned. As soon as I got into technology, I learned that one of the biggest issues we have is the lack of women. They were underrepresented right when they went to school. An issue in the Netherlands where I'm actually from is that they would get into technology, but they wouldn't stay. More than 60% would finish their degree, and then they would move out of the industry because they were done with the male-dominated industry. That's what happened in technology. But if they did stay, and they would work in technology, they usually wouldn't make it further than middle management. That's where the glass ceiling is. And if they did manage to get through that part and they co-founded a new product or a system, there was a chance that they would be driven out by their co-founders. After developing a successful product, they would be left with nothing. That happened, for example, with the founder of Bumble, right? She co-founded Tinder. When it became a success, she was being said, well, you can go. But if you make it through that, you get the VIP level of discrimination, okay? And that is called the glass 
cliff. Has anyone ever heard of the glass cliff? The glass cliff is a place in a in, in the, the timeline of a company where they know the board knows they're gonna fall off a cliff into obliteration. They're just gonna get completely, completely, they're gonna be a failure. That's the glass cliff. And do you know what they do to avoid being blamed, the board? They hire a woman as a CEO because it turns out that in our societies, we're more likely to blame women for mistakes. And so they know that if they put a woman there right before the company goes into obliteration, they can avoid the blame. So that's when women get hired. That is something that is, we can ponder on it, right? So that was one big issue I realized. And at that time, I thought, you know, this is incredible. We need to focus on how can we empower women to have more power, but also to be not excluded, included in the industry. And I did that, for example, by running women's leadership programs. That's what I've been doing for a long time around the world. I do it in five continents and for some of the biggest governments in the world, Fortune 500 companies. And I enjoyed it a lot. I thought, you know, this is how I can make the world a better place. I can make sure I have a positive impact on society and justice for people. That's what I thought. Well, something happened in my life. So in the past year, I also was able to develop a bit of a social media following. Okay. And so within a year, I managed to get more than a hundred thousand followers. And most of these followers were people who look like me. That wasn't my intention. I thought I'm just going to talk about leadership. And I noticed that people who see me and they look like me, they feel more attracted to me. And it's something that's very natural, it turns out. That's actually a bias we all have. It turns out that at a few weeks old, we start to develop a preference for people who look like us. Okay, a few weeks old. So people who say, you know, children don't have bias. No, children are so innocent and so pure. It's not true. It's not true. Children have biases. And so one of the slogans I like to use in my inclusive leadership workshops is if you not, if you're not purposely trying to be inclusive, you're most likely accidentally excluding people. If you've not worked on that, you most likely still have those biases. Okay, and so that brought me to another thing. Obviously, like I have this whole new day job next to my normal job. Now I feel like a clown because basically a content creator is just a paid and unpaid. Why am I even saying paid? An unpaid clown who's trying to entertain her followers. And so I had to think about a strategy, you know, how do I make an impact that's positive, do justice to the people and contribute to a better world? Well, I decided I'm definitely not going to do certain things that I've seen are happening a lot. I'm not going to put a lot of focus on luxury lifestyle, food, posting food. When I know there's people on my social media following me who don't have that much food, I decided I'm not going to use my body to get followers. I don't want people to like me just because I show my body. That's something I just don't believe in. And then a lot of uh, things that are very popular are immediately canceled out. But what I decided to do is I'm going to be informative and empowering. And because I realized that my audience was mostly people who look like me, I thought I'm going to give them an overview of the most influential people we had in our history. And it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot of things I didn't know. And the funny thing is, they also didn't know because the, the, the responses I got a lot from like the series about 30 influential women, 30 influential men, Muslim men, Muslim women was, I didn't know this. I didn't think that was possible that we had these type of figures in our history. And so when I realized that they didn't know that, I didn't know that, probably most people didn't know that, okay? And when I looked a little bit further into it, I could see that, for example, when it comes to media representation of women like me, we are mostly depicted on the ground in war situations, crying, oppressed. That's what the research says. So apparently there are not a lot of examples of me who can give people an idea about Muslim people. I thought, you know what? I'm going to change that. But it's also something I want to change for you. 
And that's why I decided to give you a sneak pe- preview of three of the most influential people in technology until today. You're going to be very surprised. Okay, I can promise you you're going to be very surprised. Okay, I'm going to start off with the first person. And he is seen as the grandfather of computer science. He laid the foundation for algebra and as well as algorithms and artificial intelligence. Does anyone know his name? His name is Mohammed Ibn Musa Al-Kharismi. The algorithm is named after him because in Persia they would say al Jurismi. Okay, and he was born in what we now know as Uzbekistan, and he was actually working in Iraq, Baghdad. And people might wonder, like, Iraq? We only know bad stories about Iraq from the news. Well, you know, at that time, they actually had the biggest library the world had, the House of Wisdom. And it had a thousand times more books than they had, for example, in Spain. So that just gives you an idea, right, about how powerful and how historic this was. When you Google who is the father of computer science or algorithms, you will find Alan Turing. And he was actually born, I think, almost 1100 years later in the UK. And I mean, he was a prodigy, though. I'm not going to lie. He was an absolute prodigy. But he didn't invent the algorithm. He formalized it, though. And he wasn't the father of computer science. What's interesting, though, is that he did grow up in the UK. And the UK obviously has Oxford University. But what's really interesting to know about Oxford University is that they actually had the teaching language of Arabic required when it was first founded. Because the books they used to teach were actually written in Arabic at Oxford University. So it's no surprise that even in UK, they also got that knowledge at some point and they started using it. So that is Al-Kharismi, one of the most influential people technology has ever had. Okay, then we have the second person. And last year when I was here, I talked about seven tech revolutions. And one of them was robotics, right? And I mentioned at that time that robotics is going to be huge in the upcoming few decades. But it's not something that's been recently developed. In fact, it has been developed, and I'm going to make sure I say the right year, in 1136. And that was not something that we developed, for example, in the last century. Because if you Google it, you will get that uh, someone in the U.S. invented it in the last century. But actually, the robotics were invented in 1136, and it was in Upper Mesopotamia, which is now, I guess, it would be around still Middle East, North Africa. And he was not just someone who was into robots. He also developed programming, engineering, automation. And he was one of the very first people in the world to do something like that. And then a few centuries later, we have a similar invention, but then a humanoid robot, which was invented in the Ottoman Empire. And that was about 100 years before what we now say is the real inventor of robots in the U.S. And that was like around the 1800s. So that's where robots come from. And this is, again, something that we don't have a lot of consciousness about, where this comes from. Okay, and then I have a final piece of information for you about the history of technology. And I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite people, who is Mariam Al-Ijliya. And she basically invented the first smartphone in the world. The first smartphone in the world, which was a device with mul- which had multi-purposes. You could tell time, the date, the place of where you were at. And that was something that was unheard of at that time. And Mariam lived in Aleppo in Syria. And a lot of people find it hard to believe that she would invent something like that. Because a lot of people are like, but women aren't even allowed to go to school, are they? In the Muslim world, and especially at that time. Well, they were actually. Because even if you go back to the first university who was founded, that was in the year 700 by Fatima Al-Fihriya in Morocco. She had the first university that was, gave out accredited diplomas. And that's where she studied. And many prominent people who were scholars in Europe studied there as well. That's where they got their knowledge. 
And so my final message to all of you today is know your history. If you want to do justice to the people around you, make a positive impact in the world and contribute to a better world today, then know your history. My name is Raisa Gassi and I had a lot of fun being here today. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to hearing all the other speakers speak as well. Thank you.